Hi, Year 9, Mr. Tapley here to walk you through uh, your next lesson of Year 9 Humanities, uh, looking at World War I, uh, Australian involvement in the World War I Gallipoli campaign, and why we commemorate this failure. Uh, success criteria is to summarize the Gallipoli campaign and connect the events of World War I to the development of the Anzac legend. Lesson activities will be watching the video lecture below, hopefully, uh, and reading through the class slides to complete the slide questions and activities. Uh, complete these in your digital notebook. Uh, the questions in the slides are not from Chapter 8.13, but to answer those questions, I recommend you read through Chapter 8.13. So if you're looking at those questions like, I don't know any of this information, I don't know how to answer it, Chapter 8.13 is going to be your friend, so I recommend you have that available and ready. Looks a little something like this. Anyway, so I'll run through the slides, uh, run through the resources you'll be using this lesson, and yeah, we'll see if this works. Easy. So, if you remember in the previous lesson, we looked at the Australian uh, home front. So how was the war affecting Australia at home to civilian uh, life, you know, our family and friends back home in Australia? The lesson prior to that, we talked about where Australia fought broadly, you know, we fought at uh, sea, we fought in the colonies, and we fought on the Western Front, we fought in Gallipoli. Gallipoli is the main one we'll be focusing on. It's often the first uh, thing people think of when they think of the Anzacs, when they think of World War One Australia, they think of the Gallipoli campaign. And there's a reason for that, <laughs> and we'll look at that today. Before I go any further, though, in the notes for these slides, you'll see I've attached two little videos there that you can go and watch uh, before you continue on with these activities. Feel free to do so. They're three or four minutes long. Uh, not super lengthy, just a bit of information on Gallipoli, a bit of background info. If the slides aren't giving you enough information, I just didn't want to put too many slides into this one lesson. So anyway. So, Gallipoli campaign, so it wasn't just a battle, it was a campaign that lasted for months and months and months. Specifically, it lasted from April 25th to December 18th, 1915. And although the Gallipoli campaign was a military failure, so we did not succeed in Gallipoli, you know, we lost the battle. <laughs> um, although it was a failure, the courage and determination of the Australian and New Zealand soldiers in Gallipoli helped forge the Anzac legend. Talk about what that means later on in the slides, but if you guys have seen, I keep relating it back to bloody Marvel and DC films. If you've seen uh, any film with Captain America in it, there's this bit where he gets like knocked down to the floor, and the like the bad guy looks over him like, "Oh, can you get back up?" And he gets up, and he's like, "I can do this all day." That's kind of what the Anzac legend was. <laughs> we were getting our butts kicked, but every time we got kicked down, we got shot down. We would get up, we'd wake up the next day, and be like, "All right, let's get back into it." Anyway. Poor metaphor, but we'll get into more detail later in the lesson. So what was the purpose of the Gallipoli campaign? Why were we there? This is the Gallipoli Peninsula in the Ottoman Empire, or Turkey, modern-day Turkey. And we figured, the Allies being we, uh, invading and defeating Turkey would force Austria-Hungary to send soldiers away from the Western Front down here to face the Allies, to face Australia. Once we defeated Turkey, because Turkey is right next to Austria-Hungary up there, once we defeated Turkey, uh, France and Britain would have less of a struggle up on the Western Front, because Austria-Hungary currently had most of their troops up there. We'd force them to take some down to protect Turkey. That was the theory. Um, a victory in Turkey could also influence neighboring nations like Greece, Bulgaria, Romania to join the Allies. You know, if you beat up the biggest nation in that region, everyone else is going to look to you like, okay, I should be on your side. I don't want any trouble. So we thought we could get more support for the war in Europe. Uh, we also thought that if the Allies gain control of the Gallipoli Peninsula, so if we control this land, it means we can use this Strait of Water, the Dardanelles Strait. And that would allow us to ship through uh, weapons, ammunition, food, clothing, etc., through to Dardanelles to Russian troops on the Eastern Front. At this point of the war, they hadn't lost yet, but if you remember the uh, Eastern Front, uh, that faded away pretty quickly because the Russian uh, army didn't have really good supplies. They didn't have good leadership, but they also lacked you know, just basic equipment and uh, ammunition. So if we were able to take control of Gallipoli, we could potentially, you know, win 
the Eastern Front. We could help out old mate Russia. Didn't work, but in theory, it was, uh, it was a good idea. So, the Allied troops landed at Cape Hellas in Gaba Tepe, and I apologize for any of you uh, with Turkish descent, because I've mispronounced both of those, I'm sure of it. <laughs> After a day of ferocious fighting, the Turks won control of the high cliffs among the coastline. They hold the high ground. So this is a painting recreation of the landing uh, at uh, Gallipoli. And as you can see, it's not like a flat beach. It's not like St. Kilda Beach or something like that. It's very rocky. It's very elevated. So we're down here where the water is. We've just landed there. Our goal was to get up here to where the Turks are shooting down on us. Didn't succeed. If you have the high ground in this sort of location, that's a huge advantage to your uh, your cause, your military. So by controlling the high cliffs, the Turks already have the advantage at this stage. There was a famous quote from an Anzac who said, after this failed first day, like, oh, we've already lost. <laughs> he was probably being a bit pessimistic, but he was not wrong. So, didn't get the cliffs. However, we did gain a move my giant head, a foothold on the beaches, where we began digging trenches. So we start setting up our trench warfare shenanigans. However, this first day, when all we got was these measly little beaches, came at a great cost. So over two thousand three hundred Anzac lives were lost on that very first day of fighting. The Gallipoli campaign was not to be a quick, glorious victory the Australians had expected. So we'd gone off to war thinking, oh yeah, you know, honor and glory, this will be great, you know, prove ourselves as a country. That first day was a rude awakening. <laughs> we were like, oh no, this is what war is, this is bad. Um, the fighting continued for months as the summer heat increased. Rotting corpses in no man's land attracted insects and fatal diseases as soldiers struggled with typhoid and dysentery. Not great diseases to struggle with. Every day was a struggle for survival. Uh, failed offences like lone pine and neck, you can do a bit of research on what those were if you'd like, uh, caused catastrophic losses of life. So that first day starts to look uh, almost pleasant by comparison. <laughs> After months of fighting, months of brutal fighting, victory was deemed unachievable, and the decision was made to withdraw from Gallipoli. Fun fact about the Gallipoli campaign, the most successful part of that campaign for the Allies was the retreat, which is a bit depressing. But, uh, yeah. So, at this point, I'd like you guys to smash open the digital notebook, and I'd like you to use the link below and view the photographs of soldier life at Gallipoli. So you just need to pick one image, one image of the you know, 15 images available. Tell me why you selected that image, why you found that in uh, image interesting, or why you found it um, confronting, or, you know, why did you select that image? <laughs> and tell me what that photograph tells you about Anzac experiences, Anzac life at Gallipoli. So that link there will take you to, there we go, this website here. And it gives you a little bit of background information about the Gallipoli campaign and the contributions of the Anzacs. And then you can see they've got 15 different photos of the Anzac life uh, at Gallipoli. So you've got wounded comrade here, get cricket, Australia, Anzac Cove. It's where we landed on the beaches, some first aid personnel, and anyway, I'm not going to go through all of them. But also, if you click on, see, object record, uh, it gives you a bit more information about that specific image. Or it should. There we go. Oh, yeah. Description. There you go. Boop, 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 boop. So that should really help you with the questions on this slide. Uh, cool. Get back into it. That should only take you a few minutes. Uh, so after you completed that, keep smashing through it. So that was Gallipoli. That was the infamous Gallipoli campaign that you've hopefully <laughs> heard about at this stage of your life. Um, so why do we celebrate Gallipoli? Why do we celebrate Gallipoli? Well, it contributed to the Anzac legend. There are many Australians who saw World War I as a chance to prove themselves as individuals and as a nation. So at this stage of our country's existence, Federation was 1901, that was when Australia became a country, when it became Australia. At this stage, we hadn't really done much on the global uh, scale. We hadn't really proven ourselves to other countries of the world. We hadn't proven our worth to Britain, you know, the empire. But the efforts of the Anzacs in victory and defeat were celebrated at home by their World War I allies. The mateship, bravery, and achievements of the Anzac at Gallipoli were seen to represent Australian ideals and give Australia the legendary identity it sought. They were like the superheroes of Australia. They were you know, our heroes. They were idols. They were revered. They were role models. This is how you should be 
as an Australian. You should be courageous. You should be determined, resilient. If you get knocked back down, you get back up. You know, it's like Captain America, Jif. <laughs> I can do this all day. They just got their uh, butts kicked <laughs> so thoroughly at Gallipoli, but they got back up again. That was what Gallipoli was about. Although we lost, we kept going back out at it. And that's a very impressive thing to do. If you know that you're going to lose, if you know that there's a very good chance you are about to die rushing across into no man's land, it's impressive that you do it anyway. It wasn't successful, but it was very courageous and it was very resilient how they uh, survived for months and months and months in these brutal conditions and made it home to tell the story. So this is a very famous quote from a, uh, I suppose you call him a historian, a writer, author, uh, C.W. Bean. Uh, and he said about the Anzacs, what motive sustained them? It lay in the metal, the character, the uh, identity of the men themselves. Life was very dear, but life was not worth living unless they could be true to their idea of Australian manhood. So life was not worth living unless they were Australian, unless they were living up to the ideals, the uh, legacy of those who had come before them. So how do we celebrate Anzac, uh, the Anzac legend? Well, the first Anzac Day was observed in April 25th, 1916. So that was during the war. <laughs> so we're celebrating this stuff during the war, so a year after um, a year after Anzac uh, landing, so the first day in the Anzac campaign. Um, so we observed it in uh, 1916. The initial message of this day was pride in British heritage, loyalty to the empire, honorable sacrifice. So early on, so when this war was still occurring, Anzac Day wasn't so much about Australia, it was about making Britain proud. It was about our British heritage, loyalty to the empire, you know, God save the queen, all that jazz. However, over time, we began to recognize Anzac Day and the Anzac legend as uniquely Australian. This was the efforts of the Australians um, in World War One, And it evolved as the nation recognized the valor and courage of the Anzacs in schools, churches, public gatherings, and military parades. So there's lots of ways and lots of locations where we celebrate the Anzac legend. The Anzac legend has had an indisputable impact on the nation and people of Australia. It's why we honor the Anzacs over 100 years after Gallipoli. Uh, if we were at school, <laughs> we would have had uh, the last post. We would have had someone read out, uh, you know, lest we forget. You know, you've probably heard that before at sporting events, at uh, school assemblies. Um, and just to show you the impact of the Anzac legend, this article here is from... New face of the Australian, you know, Digger Heroes of Dilly. That's not from 1915, obviously. <laughs> Hopefully you can tell that. But you can see how we still live up to the Anzac legend today. So that's our modern day military who are living up to the legends of those who came before it. Commemoration and remembrance. So I just very quickly want to tell you guys about this word here, commemoration. If I celebrate something, that means I am, you know, I'm happy, I'm bouncing around, I'm smiling, clapping my hands because it was a you know a wonderful thing and we want to celebrate, we want to recognize that it's a super amazing thing. If I commemorate it, less jovial, less uh, laughter and happy smiling faces. <laughs> Commemorating something is less about celebrating and more about recognizing. So you are recognizing what's happened and you are paying respect. So it's about recognizing and respect. That's what commemoration is about. So we don't celebrate the Anzacs like woo, we lost. We we got our butts kicked. <laughs> we commemorate it. So we recognize, we honor, we respect those uh, who died in Gallipoli. So, about World War One, It is because every person in every nation must sooner or later come for the first test to a supreme test of... Oh, no. Take two. <laughs> this is a quote, by the way. Um, it is because... Because every person and every nation must sooner or later come for the first time to a supreme test of quality, and the result of that test will hearten or dishearten those who come afterwards. For Australia as a nation, that first supreme test began in the early hours of Sunday, April 25th, on the Gallipoli Peninsula. What that quote's saying there is that Gallipoli was important because, well, one, it was important, and two, because it was the first important event in our world history. So this was our first test as a country, as uh, soldiers, as a nation. This was the first test in our history, our very short history. That's why we commemorate and we remember uh, World War I and we remember Gallipoli because it was the very first time where we acted as a nation, if you will. 
Uh, this quote is inscribed at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra, another uh, location in the country where you will see uh, ma commemoration and remembrance to World War I, the AWM in Canberra. Uh, it reflects on the significance of the Gallipoli campaign to Australian identity as our first test as a nation. However, there are those who believe that war should not be celebrated, and monuments to these violent tragedies glorify war. So while all of these uh, buildings, while all of these shrines and plaques and statues, books, songs, poems, etc., while all of these things do exist and are celebrated or commemorated around the country, there are those people who believe that war should not be celebrated or remembered in any way because they believe that it glorifies war, that there are all these statues and uh, shrines, people will see these things and be like, oh, you know, war was great. Oh, we should have another war. <laughs> so, so these people do not approve of these celebrations of war. So that's a debate that's happening uh, in the past, in the present, and in the future. People will say, you know, should we have these statues and monuments to World War One, to World War Two? Are we remembering them, or are we celebrating the fact that it happened and that all these people died, that we're glorifying, making it seem better than it was, these horrible atrocities? So those are the questions I want you guys to ask. This is the end of the, the uh, lesson, so you can finally stop listening to me voice in a few minutes. <laughs> in your digital notebook, record your responses to the following questions. Number one. So I'm asking for your opinion in most of these questions. No right or wrong answer. I just need you guys to give me your opinion and explain why. Justify your response. So question one, do you believe war should be celebrated? Why or why not? Question two, do you believe war should be commemorated? So should we remember this war? Why or why not? So you may need to look up the definition of commemoration and celebration, see the differences there for these two questions. Question three, how is war specifically? Uh, how is war, specifically World War I, commemorated in Australia? I'm after two or three examples there. So those can be uh, buildings, those can be you know, locations, groups or institutions, holidays, um, you know, any sort of tradition that's uh, commemorating World War I in Australia. Two or three examples. And again, Chapter 8.13 should provide you with some of that information. Boop, boop. There we go. Or not? Yeah. That should... Where is it? Anzac Day and Anzac Legion. There we go. So that's some information to help you out there. Cool. Um, so if you have any questions, guys, please let me know. I uh, don't think there was anything else on my to-do list to talk to you guys about. No, that's all I've got to say. Thanks, guys. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Any questions, email me, comment on Google Classroom. Cheers.